This is the BBC. My name is Connie Huck and I've lived in Ealing on and off for 42 years now and I've had a very urban upbringing but my mum came here from Bangladesh. She lived in a small village called Pubna, extremely rural. She grew up surrounded by palm trees and lakes and living in London she missed the landscape of her childhood. And today for Open Country I've come back to the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, a place that my mother used to take my sisters and I when we were children because being immersed in the greenery here and the tropical climate, particularly of the palm house, reminded her of her home. I want to revisit those memories and also find out more about the amazing work that goes on at Kew. So we're here in the palm house now and I'm with my sister Newton Newton's my eldest sister. We've got another one, haven't we, in the middle? In the middle, yep. Rupa. And we're surrounded by palm trees and greenery. It's very balmy and warm. It's nice and warm because Mm. it's freezing outside today. Does it remind you of being back in the good old days here with Mum? Mum used to bring us into the palm house and straight away look for bananas, (laughs) mangoes and coconut trees so that she could say... I used to climb up coconut trees when I was a little girl. And so where she lived in my grandfather's house in Pubna, it backed onto several lakes that had koi carp in. So for breakfast, often my uncles used to dive into the lake, catch carp with a small cast net and fry it up for breakfast. Well, the aunties used to fry it up for breakfast, yeah. not the uncles. <laughs> And also the children would often get mangoes from the mango trees. And my mum used to, didn't she? Whenever mangoes were in season, she'd go to Wembley, to Alperton, where all the Asian shops shops are. And get a huge box of mangoes. And she'd cut them up, you know, because she wanted us to know all the things that she grew up with. And so when I was 14, we went on sort of a big family holiday to Bangladesh where she could actually show us the village and the greenery that she'd chatted about so many times because this was the kind of nearest thing to it, wasn't it? So whenever we had family visiting, there was sort of like a list of places that we'd take them to show them, you know, this is London, which was sort of Buckingham Palace. Big Ben. Yeah, Madame Two Swords and Kew Gardens, yeah. So she could show off because I don't know what it is, but it feels like whenever we have relatives or people visiting from Bangladesh and my mum and all her friends they're so into plants and greenery she could never walk past a rose bush could she without having to you know have a look at it and, and admire smell it and, the yeah. roses you know the other plant that reminds me mm. that mum used to take us to with the betel nut tree oh yeah betel nut Be- they chew betel nut leaves yeah. in Bangladesh don't they thankfully our mum didn't no. but a lot of Bengalis chew betel nut and they end up with red teeth terrible teeth my mum didn't like it at all it's like the equivalent of how she she, she used to frown on smoking she'd frown on people that chewed pun as it was called so i've forgotten all about that it's funny isn't it i also wanted to spot a mango tree because i remember do you remember mangy yes (laughs) (laughs) when connie was teething mum used to always give her the mango stone so connie used to suck and i love on the mango i still love mango Alfonso mangoes are the best. Connie was chewing on a mango stone and she decided she would plant it in the same pot as our rubber plant in the house. So she planted it. This is older this than when I was teething, I have to add. This is another year with another mango harvest. So I'd pro- probably be, what, about five or six? I can't actually remember. Anyway, <laughs> the upshot of the story was a mango plant sprouted and it grew and it actually thrived in our house. It we gave any mangoes though, but it was a lovely little mango tree in our yeah, house. Yeah, it was Called Mangy. I, I used to call it Mangy. <laughs> we weren't allowed pets. pets. Yeah, my mum didn't want us to ever have cats or dogs or anything like that. So I had, yeah, Mangy, my pet mango tree. Is this a mango tree? Because those That's look like the, the leaves, don't they? Let's walk around and see if we can spot a mango tree. I can remember we would come here and it was like a big family day out so mum would like pack flasks of drink and food I mean the culture is very much about eating it anyway but because we didn't grow up in the countryside and my mum did I think this was a sort of way for her to sort of show us and teach us growing up in 
Bangladesh and it was an instinctive thing. It wasn't like she'd had a formal biology lesson and someone had said, this is a date palm, this is a beetle nut tree, this is a banana tree. She grew up surrounded by yeah. these plants. You know, we've been talking about mum, does it make you miss her? Yeah, I mean, it really does. The weird thing is, is I don't just associate Q with... Because my mum passed away last year, and I don't just associate it with those going back far memories. Because we've always lived in West London, and so, you know, it's actually not sad for me to be here. It's sort of happy, because she loved it here as well so much. I agree with you. It's been really nice to come here today because I don't think I've come here with you. No, for ages. it's the first time we've been together since we were kids. Lots of lovely memories. Thanks for bringing me. As good as our plant knowledge was, well, maybe not, I'm going to meet someone now that really has a much better and extensive knowledge of all the plants here in the palm house. Selene de Kerry is a horticulturalist here. Day to day, keeping this plant house in order, how often do you have to sort of prune and trim and so, manicure? Yes, <laughs> it is a tropical rainforest and it grows, it is protected, it is fed, it is the right temperature, so it grows freely. So our, our job as horticulturists is to kind of maintain it so it doesn't go totally wild. So we have to prune quite often and it's all about, in the winter, uh, we give a really hard prune to bring more light because in the UK you don't have as much light as in the tropics. Yeah. So we need to prune quite harsh, so that's why it's a bit bare at the moment. This but is bare? It, it, yes, <laughs> wow. but it would grow, it would grow um, quite quickly and then we have to come back in May and give a lighter prune. So it's a constant battle in a way. So the Panmas is organised uh, geographically, and here we are in the Southeast Asia end. Um, so, and yeah. In fact, we're stood right next to a jackfruit tree. That is the national fruit of Bangladesh. Do all the trees so bear fruit? So yeah, we do get some fruit. The jackfruit, they, start, they often start quite small and never reach maturity because, um, but especially now in winter, we don't have enough light. Yes. But we did have um, the full jackfruit once really? before I was wow. here. Um, but then because of the restriction in size, we have to prune the plant quite often. So that limits the fruit and the flowering. And then over there, mangoes. Have you ever had a mango from I your mango tree? I think um, the mango tree hasn't given a mango yet, but we have a new one, which is a smaller specimen, ah. which is in a pot um, in the north end now. And we hope that from this one, because it would grow smaller, we might reach maturity and, and get a fruit the full size. But for the moment, it's the same as the jackfruit. They, they start very small and then are bought. Right, because I grew a mango tree at home for many years indoors but I never got a fruit off it. How, how many years would it take to get a fruit from a mango tree? I don't exactly know but some trees take um, quite a while to reach maturity. Sometimes it, it gets to 15 years but sometimes oh. 40 years. Boo! There goes my homegrown organic mm -hmm. mangoes. How did this palm house come about at Kew? So the palm house was built in 1844. It was certainly the first one to be built of that scale in the UK, if not in the world. And they had to have help from architect and um, iron worker from the boat industry in order to span such a huge distance right. and to go as high as they could so they could get as much plants in there to mature to their full size. That explains the shape. The shape of the Pamas is an inverted boat. The collection obviously wasn't as extensive as it is now. The Pamas was built to host um, tropical plant, not just palms. And one of the first one was maybe the Coco de Mer, which is the largest seed in the world. Wow. From Seychelles. So back then, so my mum was enthused very much about the, the banana trees, the mango trees. She's, she's very much into plants that bear something you can eat. So yeah, I think those would have been the prime one that they would show off because right. it's, it's what we use and so it's, so, it's such a curiosity. And so what do you think the plant collection here means to people that visit? Well, I think everybody's got their own story. Some people, came, like you, came here uh, when they were little and so they've got all this memory build up and everybody recognises a plant that they've seen either in their grandma's glass house and it, it's a memory or some, some plant that they've seen in the wild 
and remind them of the their travels, story and their and travel. And so I think everybody creates their own story with, with what they see here and, and have their own feeling about it. Well, thank you so much. You've now given me inspiration. I'm going to go and find out a little bit more about the science side of the plants here at Kew, and that's at the Jodrell Laboratory. I'm now in a room which is actually what I would term as the antithesis of what you imagine when you think of Kew Gardens. When I hear Kew Gardens, I conjure up images of lush greenery and plants and nature in the open air. And I'm in essentially a very high-tech looking lab. Lots of people in lab specs and lab coats on chairs at computers, surrounded by all sorts of sort of laboratory paraphernalia, microscopes, so on and so forth. And I am stood next to Ilya Leach, who can enlighten me on a little bit more because this is kind of like the hidden side of Kew Gardens. Yeah, certainly. Here we've got over 300 scientists working on a whole range of different aspects of plant and fungal diversity, going from sort of basic science to understanding what makes them grow and survive, as well as the bigger questions of how asking how a plant's going to cope with climate change. So um, you're on the cutting edge here when it comes to plant conservation and sort of going forward in the future and the threats to plants. When did this come about? Was the Jodrell Laboratory always here? Q was first found in 1759 mm. and it was at that stage a collection for understanding the correct naming of plants. Initially these people were basing their understanding of how plants were related based on what they looked like, their sort of morphology, their flower structure, right. their leaf structure. And in the sort of 1850s and 60s people wanted to start looking at inside the plant, start looking at their anatomy and at that stage they wanted to actually build a lab to enable them to do this. And is it true that there's more plant diversity here at the Jodrell Laboratory than there is in the whole of the Amazon rainforest? Is that a rumour? <laughs> no, that's true. Really? I, will, I want to show you a spot in where a one metre square where we keep no. all the DNA samples that we extract from the plants and they're stored in this DNA bank and as you will see, it consists of about 55,000 little test tubes, each containing DNA samples from different Can plant I species. See? I'm delighted yes. to show you. Let, let's go. <laughs> right. So, here, it, it may not look so exciting, but this is a, our freezer, which is kept at minus 80 degrees to maintain the DNA. So here wow. we have one of the trays, each containing uh, Tiny lots little of little vials. samples. So this is a sample of a relative of coffee that we drink is one of the wild relatives. Coffea congensis, yes. Wow. And so this is a sample that was extracted that has been used for DNA sequencing. We hear a lot about animals that are facing extinction and animal species that have died out. How does that compare with plants? Have there been many plant species to die out within our lifetime? Are there many that are totally under threat? They are vulnerable because if the climate changes or invasive species come in, they aren't able to compete successfully, they will die out. In a survey that was carried out last year as part of a report that Q was coordinated called the State of the World's Plants, estimated that one in five of plant species are indeed at risk of extinction. So Q and other organisations around the world are, are aiming to help to understand what particular threats plants are under and what makes some plants more resilient to change than others and help us to understand so that that can inform conservation strategies. Thank you so much, Ilya. It's been fascinating. Well, I'm delighted to show you. I mean, it's been great fun too. <laughs> Who would have thought I'd have so many changes of scenery at Kew Gardens? So I've now come from a lab to essentially a building site. Um, I've donned a hard hat and a high-vis jacket and we're getting to the Temperate House, which has been undergoing a restoration. But the Temperate House is another of the greenhouses that I'd come to with my mum when I was a child. And it's now the largest surviving Victorian glass house since the demolition of Crystal Palace. I'm very privileged today because I'm going to get a little sneak preview. Georgie Darrick, the project coordinator, is going to show me round. Are we nearly at the end stages, Georgie? Yes, we are at the critical end stages at the moment. So last two months to go. So wow, you're... so proper end stages. Because it has been five years since I've probably over five years since I've been in here. How many plants had to come out then? 
So we lifted about 500 plants back in 2013, but there's about 10,000 going back in. Wow. And they've increased the species diversity in this house significantly as well. So oh. whilst you know we may have lost some of the big palms out of necessity, we've increased our collection in an important way. We're surrounded by sort of um, tipper trucks and JCBs. So when you come into the centre block, you can really see how um, they managed to spend a lot of money in this area alone. Because yeah. it is, it's this enormous sort of cathedral-like structure which could fit the palm house in it. Yes. And it's uh, cast iron and wrought iron, and, and there are cast iron details all the way up the rafters there, so you can see the flowers and the thistles. Yeah. So it's a really beautiful design. So have some of the plants stayed in here the whole time? Yes, they have wow. actually, yes. It, it was always going to be a risk if they wanted to, if the Hort team wanted to move them. So we had to create these sort of biomes for them to protect them. So they were completely surrounded with sheeting and had their own heating and watering system essentially. So we've had survival of not all of them unfortunately, but it's, it's been a good amount that have, is left over. So all the really tall palms in the, the north block for example, and there's a couple in here in the centre block, they've been here for the whole ride really. Looking a bit dusty afterwards. <laughs> So we're in the south block now and this is the African section. So more specifically it's sort of southern Africa and Namibia, so where the temperate regions of Africa are. So it's a lot quieter here because work seems to have finished more or less here. It's looking pretty much done. Now is this where you've got the saddest, loneliest plant in the world, is that right? <laughs> yeah, the Encephalatus woodii. It's been reinstalled back here in the south block. You can go have a look. Yes, please. It's a very good looking plant for the saddest, loneliest plant. It's a handsome plant. The Encephalatus woodii is, is a cycad. It's, it's the loneliest plant in the world because they only ever found a male of the species. So these cycads are dioecious, they have male and female plants. And so at the moment we've just got the boy. So Aww. yeah, he needs in need of a partner. But they do produce offshoots, so clones essentially. So but they're male clones. Only male, male clones. clones, yeah, it's a boys' club. So was was he kept here during the restoration because he's such a rarity? No, well they had originally thought because they didn't want to disturb the plant that yeah. they'd leave him in but it was too risky so they they lifted him and put him in this, this big wooden box, containerized him essentially and he was in our decant facility which is near the nursery on site. That's a big job because he must have quite big roots. Yeah. Well, what you do before mm. you lift them is you root prune them to reduce right. those. So yeah. that's a, a process done over several months. So this is his final place, as far as we're concerned. He's there, he's installed for posterity in the future. So I'm now driving west from Kew Gardens out on the A40 to my next destination, which is North Isle of Fields. So Kew Gardens is somewhere that my mother brought me and my sisters to many times when we were younger. And North Isle of Fields is somewhere where I like to take my children. It's those four cone-shaped hills that you may have seen if you've ever been driving between London and the west along the A40, just by North Holt. And this park is very unique and has won awards for its design and was made from landfill, essentially. I'm gonna go and meet some people who can tell me more. I'm Chris Welsh, I'm Park Operations Manager for Ealing Council. And I'm Brad Decker, I'm Contract Monitoring Officer with Ealing Council. John Coleman, uh, Amy Supervisor for Grounds Maintenance and long living local. Yes, come on, huddle in gang. Let me quickly paint the picture. We're at North Isle of Fields, which are four mounds. The tallest is 25 metres. They're man-made hills that are fantastically eco-friendly because they were all made from landfill Good. when Wembley Stadium was being knocked down. Yeah, Wembley and uh, the excavation for Westfield Shopping Centre. So that was a lot of rubble to get rid of. Yeah, it was a, a million tonnes were imported onto site. Wow. And it's very unusual for London to have a project like this, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think the size of this site is you know, 26, 27 hectares of essentially what was 
derelict land that used to be sports fields, when the pavilion burnt down, there wasn't really much left on site. To have a site of that size within London uh, and to be able to do a project of this scale, I think, is, is very unique. So clever. Who, who conceived this idea? How did the whole thing come about? Peter Fink was the landscape architect. I think he designed, designed it pretty much from scratch and knew that those two projects were happening in London and that they, the material could come here and then design everything that connects. So it's basically you got all the runoff from the hills, goes into a series of ditches that go into the fishing ponds that go into the wet, there's sort of a wet marsh on the lower end of the site. It is an amazing vision, I have to say. I mean, they're essentially four giant Teletubby style hills in a row and they've each got their own sort of personality. This one almost looks sort of Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. in the way it's sort of tiered. And the whole thing, am I right in saying it's cost neutral? It was a good partnership agreement between the contractor and the council. The income essentially was generated from the, the waste coming out of those sites. So the ticket, every load that came through, there was a, a fee associated with each load. And then that money was essentially put back to the contractor to build the site. And in the end, you know, it was 5.3 million that cost the council nothing to do. And, and what's brilliant about using the landfill is that you know, flat land can be really boring. This is such an interesting area. And also it sort of advertises itself because when you are driving down the A40, you can see it and it's so intriguing. It's what? behind those mountains. Yeah, the amount of times <laughs> I've been with people that have said exactly that, giving a lift to someone in the car that's never seen it before. Is that, would you agree, yeah, John? A lot of people don't know what's behind there, so they drive past, pull in just to see what's behind, they go for a walk and wow, what an amazing place it is. Yeah. So John, you're a local resident. Was there lots of opposition? Because there often is when there's a new building project or a regeneration I mean, scheme. A lot of people didn't know about the initial plan for the place until, like you said earlier, when they started seeing lorries coming in, then they started questioning. And when people learnt about what was going on, there was a lot of interest started getting in. I believe local people on the estate started getting involved. So the actual group that got interested it grew bigger and bigger. So by the time it came about, it was very welcomed. Yes, yeah. yeah. That's good. I it mean, was, It was very much needed in this area as well. So I've been up high to the summit and now I'm walking back down low because I'm going to go over to the fishing lakes to hear about a really great initiative. I do believe the two people I'm meeting are waiting for me. Hi. <laughs> hello. Hello, Sarah, right? Sarah, and hello. Yes. Right. Okay, so what do you both do? I know it's got something to do with fishing and these lakes. <laughs> Tell me more. Absolutely. Well, we both work for the charity Get Hooked on Fishing. I'm the chief executive. And basically, we run the facility here and manage the six coaching lakes. What we try to do is make it fun and entertaining for you know families and the local community. So I, it's, fishing isn't something I usually associate with young people. Is that me stereotyping a lot? You're helping more and more sort of youths get into it. Yes, absolutely. And um, you're right in that you know the, the current sort of angling population is quite an ageing one. And what we're finding is that there's a lot of youngsters out there who want to have a go, but there's nobody to actually take them. Like myself, I grew up in London, pretty local to this area. My dad was a fisherman, so I always had someone to take me, and that's how I got into it. But I mean, in an area like this, where there isn't much to do anymore and there's a lot of youth clubs shutting down and things like that. This is a great haven for people to come and we, we mentor people and teach them how to fish, these youngsters. And even if they don't continue fishing for the, for the rest of their life, you know, they've tried it and even if we can teach them a few things in a way that might help them with something else they do, then that's what we're here for, you know, just give people a good time. So Charlie, how did you get involved? Well, I actually started fishing with my dad when I was younger, like I said, and, and did that as a hobby. And it was actually a strange story, really. I, I got invited to go to an open open day, which get some fishing my host in a, a lake cl close to here. I sort of misread the event, if you like. I turned up my own stuff and started fishing. But ended up actually mentoring another youngster that came along that day. It's a pretty miserable day's fishing, to be honest. <laughs> and just stayed in touch with Sarah, started to volunteer a little bit, and then ended up coming here on a regular basis because I really liked the place. Helping youngsters and fishing was, was something I wanted to do. Started on a fishing apprenticeship, and it all just flew from there. Really. Mm, yeah, we, we appointed him as uh, assistant project manager and then just a year ago, in fact, yeah. he was promoted to um, actual project manager. That's so that's, uh, you, know, you know, really the absolutely fantastic journey, isn't it? So. Yeah, and uh, just all of that just came about from when you turned yeah. up to another girl yeah, yeah. at the local park. That's it, exactly <laughs> that. <laughs> 
just stood here and listening, you can just hear so many different sort of bird calls and, you know, we've had more hens coming up to us and, you know, the seagulls flying by and the geese. It really is an oasis.